Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is June 1st, 2012, and my guest is Jonah Lehrer. His latest book is Imagine, How Creativity Works. Jonah, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm a big fan. Now, until recently, creativity was something of a black box. Uh, it was a magical, mysterious thing. And of course, at various points in your book, it's, you, you remind us that it still is. But in recent years, neuroscience has helped us understand more about how creativity works. What are some of the important things that we've learned about the brain and creativity? Well, I think the very first thing we've learned is that the imagination does exist inside those three pounds of meat, uh, that even though for thousands of years we, in a sense, outsourced the imagination to the muses, now it's quite clear that it really does come from inside our head. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think one thing, the, the big idea neuroscience has given us, and I think it's very important to, at the outset, just emphasize just how provisional all this research is. It's very much a first draft of, of what's happening inside the brain whenever we do anything, whether it's make a decision on a, you know, investment task or, or you give people a set of difficult creative problems. This is very much a first draft. Um, but, but I think what, what neuroscience has revealed so far is that really creativity is not a single thing at all. That even though I think we've, we've often used creative in the singular, the term turns out to be a catch-all for a variety of distinct thought processes each of which are useful at various phases of the creative process. So sometimes you're going to need a moment of insight, one of those big eureka moments, one of those epiphanies in the shower, those answers that come out of the blue. And, and sometimes you're just going to need good old-fashioned work and working memory, um, you know, that 99% perspiration side of things. Um, so, so you know, the science has so far just shown us that it's actually quite complicated, that there is no one way we should always be thinking when we want to be creative. Um, that, that instead, it's, it's, it's really about different ways of thinking, which are useful for solving different kinds of problems. So in a sense, the real task for someone in the, create, you know, in the creative business is to make sure you're thinking in the right way at the right time. And we see that different kinds of creativity in different act parts of the brain, right? Which yeah. Which is really yeah. extraordinary. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so this is thanks to the wonder of fMRI and EEG. Um, these various tools that allow us to actually see the mind at work. And once again, these are imperfect tools. Um, they are just kind of rough glimpses. But I think they have shown us some quite interesting stuff. Um, they have shown us that, that, that the brain at work looks very different. If you give someone a problem that requires a set of remote associations, so, so it's typically solved in a moment of insight, then if you give them a creative problem that just requires more analytical thought. Um, that, that, that we can see that these different types of creative thinking really have different substrates inside the brain. So let's talk about those two different kinds, the aha and the persistence kind, uh, what you later call grit, which is a thing I like a lot because I think grit is remarkably undervalued. Uh, there's no romance. Yeah. There's not much romance about grit. Uh, there being <laughs> no, no, no. There's nothing romantic about it at all. I'm actually writing an article right now for The New Yorker about Grit. Uh, so, so I'm, 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 I'm deep in the midst of grit. Uh, so, but, but, but I couldn't agree more that I think it really is a, a very, very important creative trait. So I'm 57, and it took me about 50 something years to realize uh, that when you can't remember something, which is something that starts to happen to you as you get older, one of the best things you can do is not think about it, which is sort of paradoxical, right? You'd think, yeah. well, the more I think about it, the better I'll. And one of the themes of your early part of the book, which, um, was is is very moving and and beautifully evoked is how sometimes not thinking about things helps you think about them, and I wonder if you might talk about that uh, and some of the ways sure. that people have enhanced their creativity by not working, uh, which is sure. by the way always a great idea. I, you know, it yeah, sells. no, no, it's it's a. It, you know, it's always wonderful when the science justifies laziness. That's yeah. my favorite. It's my favorite kind of science. Um, you know, the the larger theme here, and this has just been a theme in modern neuroscience since the last 15, 20 years, is really the the importance of unconscious thought processes. Um, that that even when our conscious attention is being distracted, um, when we are not lavishing attentional resources on a problem, we should know that our unconscious is often still mulling it over. 
and and the unconscious is you know the the massive supercomputer inside your head. It's a parallel processor. It can actually take in and digest a lot more information than your conscious brain. So 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 this is kind of the larger thematic backdrop for this research on moments of insight, um, which is that you know even when you're not thinking about it, you're still thinking about it. Um, and 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 I begin the book by talking about Bob Dylan and how he wrote Like a Rolling Stone, and he actually wrote the song after he quit the singing and songwriting business, after he told his manager after a grueling tour in London that he was done writing protest songs, he was done with the singing and songwriting, he's going to move to Woodstock and become a novelist and painter. And so for a couple of days, that's what he did. He began writing his novel, made a few little paintings, um, and then he felt what he called the itch of unwritten words, this very familiar feeling. And then he just started writing them all down. Um, and after 20 minutes of write, excuse me, after several hours of writing and 20 pages of writing, he ended up coming up with the lyrics for Like Rolling Stone, which he then recorded the following week. And I, I use that story both because I'm a Dylan freak um, and, and a huge fan, um, but also because it does, I think, reveal something very interesting about the creative process, that even though we live in this day and age that worships attention, that assumes the only way to be productive is to focus, 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 to chain ourselves to our desk and stare straight ahead the computer screen. When it comes to solving the hardest creative problems, to writing that radically new kind of rock song, to having one of the, you know, for having one of these moments of insight, that's often the exact wrong approach. That, that you absolutely, you know, as you put it in terms of recovering that word you can't remember, you want to stop thinking about it. That, that actually makes the answer much more likely to arrive. Uh, there's this wonderful line of Einstein's that creativity is the residue of wasted time. And I think when you need a moment of insight, when you need a very big breakthrough, you need to put in the work, of course, to hit the wall. But once you hit the wall, you need to make time to waste time. Yeah, it's um, it's great advice, as I said, but I think it's undeniably true as well, not just comforting to those of us who don't work 24-7. Yeah. Um, what I find is when I'm in a creative mode – it just does – you can't turn it off. It's that 20 pages of Dylan, not that I have anything like yeah. Dylan. But, and then there's times that just – you know you're wasting your time. Uh, it just isn't yeah. going to be there. You need to let the well fill up. Yeah, no, and, and, and you know, it's important to really waste time, to not be like you know, working in front of the television. Um, just last week, a paper came out by Jonathan Schooler at UCSB. Who I, I said a bunch of his research on daydreaming in the book, and he's got a new paper on daydreaming, which he really shows – you need to be lost in the sauce, so to speak. You need to really not be working on the problem. That, that, that people who are kind of half working on the problem, so they were a little bit distracted, they didn't show the same incubation gains, the same gains from their unconscious as people who were totally wasting their time. So, you know, I was just talking to him last week and he summarized the study as basically when you go on vacation, you should really go on vacation. You shouldn't be checking your email every 10 minutes. You should really make every time. Every 20 minutes. You should do it every 20. Every 20, yeah, every, every, every 20 minutes. And they should re, really <laughs> let go every once in a while. Um, just, just, just that, that for reasons he, he can't even quite explain yet. Um, but he just argues his data suggests so far that, 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 that seems to be quite important. And so I know you've been in workplaces. I think you describe in the book. I've certainly been in many myself as a visitor where, there are things you find surprising. So I was at a investment firm in New York uh, last year, and they have a ping pong table, and people are playing ping pong in the middle of the day. They're just fool yeah. clearly fooling around. They're doing yeah. nothing productive on the surface. Uh, you know, Google's got a volleyball court in the middle of of the campus, yeah. and and this seems to justify that. Um, and I think it's probably a good thing. Yeah, no, no. I, you know, I I I think this this research does justify. You know, the classic ping pong table in the lobby. Um, you know, what I often find when I see offices with ping pong tables is that people are not playing ping pong. So it's interesting to hear that you actually saw some people playing ping pong. Um, but, but, you know, if, if you're asking people to solve difficult problems, to come up with, you know, new solutions to, to, to long standing challenges, and I think you also need to give them time to not think about those problems, give them time to escape. Um, you know, you really need to build in some wasted time to their day. I think the larger lesson here is about trying to micromanage the mind, about trying to, you know, trying to legislate what productivity looks like, um, simply because I think our, our notions of productivity are often far too narrow, that, that they have to do with kind of the appearance of productivity more than they do with productivity itself. Um, simply because when you look at the human mind, it, it's got many different ways of, of coming up with useful answers. Sometimes it's about grit, it's about persistence, it's about sitting at your desk and not getting up until the problem is done. 
But often when you're working on very difficult problems that, you know, that, that, that don't have obvious or trivial solutions, you're going to need to play some ping pong, um, maybe lots of ping pong. <laughs> now, somewhat paradoxically, you also argue that in some situations the exact opposite is what you need. And you talk about Auden, the poet. Yeah. Um, and I learned some uh, things about Auden I didn't uh, I didn't know. Uh, and it was I'm also a Dylan fan. I'm also an Auden fan. So I, thought I, got a, I got a big kick out of that. And I yeah. love that poem. Is it September one, nineteen thirty nine? It's just yeah, an unbelievable yeah, exactly. poem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, really. So amazing. talk about his um, his chemical uh, experience yeah. and why that helped him, despite what we've just said. Well, Auden was a benzodrine addict. Um, Auden, in the late 1930s, when he first moved to New York City, got hooked on benzodrine. And he got hooked on the drug. Benzodrine is an amphetamine, um, so it sharpens the spotlight of attention, makes it easier to pay attention to stuff, keeps us awake and alert. He first got hooked on the drug because he wanted to work in the day and then go to nightclubs in the evening, and so he wanted to stay up late. And that's why he started taking the drug. His editor actually gave it to him. Nice. But then he quickly, <laughs> but then he quickly discovered that, that, that the drug, as he put it, turned him into a poetry machine that he could, for the first time in his life, spend 12 hours thinking about a single metaphor or a single line, uh, just just tweaking his lyrics, his verses, until they were perfect. And so you see during the Benzedrine phase, you know, 1939, 1940, 1941, 1942, this, this new kind of poetry emerged from him. It's much more spare, it's much more transparent, much more lyrical and rhetorical. Uh, and, and many of Auden's most anthologized poems, in fact, virtually all of them, come from this three to four year window when he was hooked on Benny's. Um, what's interesting is that Auden himself would later turn on these poems. He hated September 1st, 1939. Hmm. He, he really disliked a lot of his poetry from the Benzedrine phase because he thought it was too neat and, and, and too clear and, and made kind of banal points with this lovely language. So when you look at his collected poetry, September 1st, his most famous poem is nowhere in it. When he chose his own anthologies, he left out a lot of his most famous poems that were written when he was on amphetamines. I wonder, um, if, he I felt, I wonder if he felt that that really wasn't him. I wonder if he felt, you know. My guess is that may be part of it. Um, you know, I think he... I think he mistrusted the kind uh-huh. of the clarity of his language there. Um, that, that, you know, we must love one another or die is like the, you know, the iconic line from September 1st, 1939. And as Auden would later put it, that's not true. You die anyways. Uh-huh. Um, so, so, you know, so I think he, he, he had this tendency to look back on those, look back on those poems and, and just see them as, as, as too clear that, that, that he was, yeah, that he was mistaking the elegance of a line for the truth of a line. Um, and personally, you know, I, I've become much fonder of Auden's late poetry, which is messier and more ambiguous, um, but but maybe a little bit truer. When um, was when was Musée of the Beaux Arts? That Do was you know? that was again the Benzedrine phase. Yeah, that's um, another great. So yeah, no, no, that's a classic, and that actually is. is that is one of the few poems from his Benny phase, which is in his collected poems. Um, so that was one poem, um, which, which he still found a way to enjoy even later on. Um, but, but, you know, so, so I, I was, I was just fascinated by what it was about Ben's dream that, that turned Auden into a poetry machine. And, and the neuroscience can shed some light on this. We know how amphetamines work in the brain. Uh, the increase of release of dopamine from the midbrain, which makes it easier to pay attention, makes even trivial things tedious things like editing a poem or sitting in a classroom getting a pre-algebra lesson, it can make those things more interesting, make them easier to pay attention to, which is, of course, why we give kids with attention deficit disorders Ritalin and Adderall, which are mild amphetamines. Um, so, so, so it can make it easier to keep on paying attention. And, and when it comes to certain parts of the creative process, that's exactly what we need to do. We need to just, just you know, unconceal the problem, stick with it until it's perfect, to go through draft after draft, iteration after iteration. You know, as you noted earlier, there's nothing romantic about this part of the process. It is not fun at all. In fact, you know, the evidence suggests it makes us a little miserable. Um, but, but there's no getting around it. It, it, is, it is absolutely necessary. Um, you know, it's, it's a 99% perspiration yeah. phase. I'm just, not sure the ratio is 1% yeah. to 99%, yeah. but, but it's pretty damn close. Yeah. And yet, it conflicts a little bit with the point you make later, which is a writer I know and which I'm sure you know as well, which is that it's really important when you're editing your work that you put it in a drawer for a while and let it cook because it gives you a chance to forget it. And then you can yeah. read it with a fresh eye. When you're yeah. sitting there hunched over that palm for 12 hours 
it's an interesting um, thing that 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 works, but it clearly does. No, no, you know that that's that's definitely a contradiction I struggle with all the time. You know, you need to you need to go through the edits and you need to get into the shape you can put in a drawer and forget about it, and then hopefully pick it up maybe a week later, maybe a year later, whatever it is, so you can finally read it as a reader, not as the writer. Um, you know, one of the reasons I can't bear to read my books, um, you know, you know, if you're at a reading or something, I I can't actually read the text of my book. Um, just because I'll, I'll be sitting with the book and, and I'll have this tremendous urge to get out a red pen and just yeah. correct all the things in the book. Like there's something about, you know, looking at a book that, that, that you wrote or, or really anything, an article, a blog, whatever it is a little while ago. And like the errors in can death, all those bad metaphors, they, they, they glow on the page and you just want to take them all out. So it's, it's quite painful. It's just, you know. It's even it can even get the to curse the point. Of writing life. It can't happen. It's hard to happen when you're reading your own book. But a lot of times, I, I, I've read passages of documents that were teamwork, and I thought, well, that's obviously so and so's because I would never have written that. And then you realize yeah. you go back to your old draft and you realize, oh my gosh, I wrote that. It's yeah. Horrible. yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. It's, so you know, let me, we could complain all day about writing. Yeah, we won't. So let's move on. Let, let me ask you. Um, Artificial intelligence has, has made some enormous leaps and bounds. It, you know, it started with tremendous um, fanfare, didn't didn't reach its promise. Uh, recently, it's doing better. The ability of computers and other you know algorithms to mimic human human brains. But yeah. I was thinking about AC instead of AI, artificial creativity. Um, what do you think the prospects of that are? Uh, do you think we'll ever be able to? use artificial methods to solve some of these problems the way the brain can? I mean, it's a really interesting question. Um, and, and, uh, you know, I think, I think the easy answer to give right now is it's way too soon. Um, it's, you know, it's way too soon to give any kind of definitive answer. Um, oops. Certainly when it comes to evidence we have so far that it's possible, the evidence is few and far between. There are some algorithms which have come up with, you know, Sonatinas that that somehow resemble things that that look like something Bach may have written. So if you put all of Bach into a computer and they come up with something new, they can come up with you know things that that sound Bach esque. Um, but you know, I think most people would agree, even the creators would agree, they're missing that 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 spark of genius. They're missing they're missing an extra something. And then of course it you know you still have to input the works of a genius to come up with something right you know even even resembling in the same category as the work of a genius so 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 it's it's far too soon to give any kind of coherent answer as to whether or not artificial creativity will ever be possible um i think what we can say so far um is that when it comes to creativity technology is going to be full of surprises um you know one way i talk about this in the book is when you look at, you go back 15 years ago and you ask all these futurists, you know, how are all these new online tools, email, Skype, <laughs> you know, video chats, how are they going to change, you know, yeah. creativity and collaboration? Everyone said, oh, it's going to be the death of geography. It's the death of geography movement that, that thanks to these tools, we no longer need to commute to skyscrapers or live in big cities or even go to meetings in person. We're all going to live um, in Montana. Yeah, we're all going to live in the excerpts and telecommute. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, of course, that, that makes lots of logical sense. And yet the exact opposite has happened, that cities are more valuable than ever, that, that, that you know, their downtown rents keep on going up. One of my favorite factoids is that since the invention of Skype, attendance at business conferences has increased dramatically. Some estimates are that it's only doubled. Um, so, so here we have these tools that allow us to interact remotely. And yet what they've done is, you know, made it even more important to come together in person. Um, so, so, you know, maybe we'll have, I think in the beginning, at least tools, tools that, that, that automate certain parts of the creative process. Um, you know, maybe we'll have tools that make us better editors, um, that make it easier to persist through that unpleasant phase, the creative process we're going through draft after draft. But at the moment, I think it's really, really tough to imagine how one comes up with a tool that can replicate a Bach or a Bob Dylan that can answer questions we don't even know to ask yet. Yeah. Um, and, and that's often what creativity is all about. So let me ask a, a different version of this question. I, I did a podcast with my colleague Robin Hanson a while back where Robin has some interesting speculations about human beings, how easily we'll be replaced by machines. I'm skeptical, but at one point he makes the claim in there that 
that we're just chemicals. That's all the brain is. It's all chemicals. And of course, literally, it's all chemicals. The question yeah. is, in your conversations with neuroscientists, what's their feeling on that? Do they feel it's just a matter of time before we decipher everything? Or do they think <laughs> there's some fundamental mysteries there? I know the philosophy community is skeptical, but they, yeah. would, be, they would be. And the neuroscientists, yeah. I assume, are more optimistic. But what is your, what's your experience? My experience has been that it's tough to generalize. I think some neuroscientists assume that it's only a matter of time before we, you know, fully understand those three pounds of meat. You know, I was lying all the neurotransmitters, all the ion channels, all the ingredients that go to making us us. Um, you know, and then you'll talk to other neuroscientists who, who argue that, that, that there will always be some fundamental mysteries to the field, and this is the crowd, if I'm putting my bias on the table, uh, this is the crowd I'm more sympathetic to. Um, you know, they point to stuff like, you know, subjective experience, the fact that we feel like conscious creatures, that, that of course we are just a trillion synaptic connections, and yet we feel like much more than that. So in a sense, the one reality neuroscience will never be able to describe, at least in the terms of neuroscience, as, you know, as an emanation of all those chemicals and, and electrical wires inside our head, is the one reality we know, the only reality we'll ever know. Um, so there does seem around, to be a basic tension you're there. You're talking about around um, consciousness. Yeah, yeah. That that you know, here's this reduction of science that that breaks the part, and yet we feel like more than the sum of our parts. Um, so so here's the one reality we know. Neuroscience doesn't seem able to describe, at least in terms we understand it. Um, so that seems like a interesting tension in the field, which I'm think think we often sometimes gloss over. Um, you know. One one thing more practical way to measure the field is is to look at the major contributions it's made to you know practical questions so far, and I think there the track record is at best very very spotty. You know, if I ask you to list the big drugs that have that have emerged from basic research into the brain, you could come with a, up with a very very short list. You look at all the most popular drugs we have now on the market antidepressants, SSRIs, Prozac, anti-anxiety drugs, um, you know, treatments for Parkinson's. We're still giving people L-DOPA, which is more than 50 years old. Um, so, so, so all the drugs we have, you know, all the most popular drugs at least, still tend to be very old. They're often invented by accident. They didn't yeah. emerge from basic research into the brain. So I think, you know, I will, I will be more, I think, optimistic about the singularity or about being, you know, us being replaced by computers or about the potential of the field to really revolutionize, um, you know, the way we treat affliction to the brain and mental illnesses and so on when we start to see a a bevy of drugs that that emerge from basic research into the brain. At the moment, I think we've just begun to learn how little we understand. Um, so, So I think, you know, it's a very exciting field, of course. Um, it's a whole new way of knowing ourselves part of this ancient quest, you know, to know ourselves. But but I think it's very important to, at the very least, be skeptical about where it's going to take us in the next few years in the foreseeable future. Yeah, I guess it's one thing to say, yeah, we know that, um, well, let's actually, I'll use the next area I want to talk about, use an example. You talk about the part of the brain that, that restrains us, where you know, yeah. we want to blurt out something. Um, and, and it's the part of the brain that uh, is liberated when we sleep, if I remember correctly, in the book. Yeah. yeah. So talk about that. And all, all I was going to observe in this neuroscience conversation is that, yeah, it's one thing to say that's where it comes from. It's something to say how does it how does it work? I mean, we don't. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's, it's great to say it lights up, but what what the heck is going on in there? Yeah. No. 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 At the moment, Where's it's a the, very what's crude the software? cartography. What's the yeah, software? No. 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 Absolutely, <laughs> it's a very crude cartography at the moment. Um. So, so this is a part of the brain called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, um, just behind your forehead. Um, and it's a very important part of the brain. It, 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 it plays a crucial role in self-control, impulse control. Um, for instance, you know, if you look at, uh, you probably know about the marshmallow experiment, the classic experiment by Walter Michel with the four-year-olds and the four-year-olds who can not eat the marshmallow for 15 minutes. They do much better on in high school and so on. And, and so now they're actually still tracking these four-year-olds and they're now in their forties. And one of the big things they find is that those four-year-olds who could do a better job waiting for the marshmallows and then got much better SAT scores and more likely to go to college, less likely to do drugs and so on, they've got enhanced function in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Um, so, so this is a very, very important part of the brain. Um, but, but it, it does seem to play this interesting role in the creative process where it's also that voice telling us not to do something. Um, so sometimes it tells us not to eat all the haagen in the fridge, which is great, or not to spend more money on our credit card, which, again, can often be quite useful. But if, say, you're John Coltrane and you're engaged in the act of improv, you need to just pour beauty out of your instrument for 45 minutes, 
then it may actually be something you want to turn off. It, it may actually get in the way. It may tell you not to play that note because it'll sound ugly or will sound wrong. Um, and sure enough, when you put jazz pianists inside a brain scanner and you have them engage in the active improv, what you see is a deactivation of the dorsal or prefrontal cortex. And before they engage in improv, they, in a sense, inhibit their inhibitions. Um, and that makes it easier for them to create without worrying about what they're creating. Um, now, now to get back to, I think, your other question about uh, kind of the limitations of neuroscience, I think you're absolutely right to point out that this is a very crude map. We really don't understand what's going on there. All we can show at this point is that, you know, we can look at this in terms of blood flow as a proxy for neural activity. So it's not even neural activity directly. We're looking at blood flow, which is often closely coupled with neural activity. But, you know, there are some studies suggesting there can be a decoupling in certain instances and so on. Um, but, but we really more importantly don't understand what's taking place at the software level. We don't understand how this increase in blood flow, which, you know, in theory translates to an increase in brain activity, what that actually means, how showing a spike in brain activity that's one part of the brain, um, how that makes it easier for us to not eat ice cream or how it makes it harder for us to engage in jazz improvisation. Um, that of course, you know, that's the profound mystery, and we're not even close to finding ways to ask those kinds of questions. So I had a really strange idea reading your book um, based on that, and I'd love to get your reaction. I, I Right before I read your book, I read the um, Isaacson biography of Steve Jobs, mm -hmm. and your discussion of Dylan at length reminded me of um, incredible documentary by Martin Scorsese, No Direction Home. Yeah, which is ah, just an ex great. just unbelievable portrait of yeah. uh, of the the artist as a young man and yeah. and I thought about the following you know they have Jobs and Dylan had something in common which is that they blurted out often cruel things to people around them which yeah. which we often call as adults we call it selfish uh, you know a lot of people say Jobs was cruel he was mean he was selfish he was clearly very self centered and. I, it, for some reason, it, it struck a chord in me to choose a bad pun with Dylan's behavior when he was that when he was young. I mean, yeah. I don't know when he's older, but when he's portrayed in that in that documentary, many rock stars are this way. They're they're a little bit self centered um, for a whole bunch of reasons. But I started to think about the connection between what many of us would many adults would describe that behavior as immature, and many people would call yeah. Dylan and Jobs immature that they they didn't generate they didn't grow up enough to have the empathy that most adults have for other people and i wonder if that is what helped make them so creative yeah. um that that something maybe in their brain that didn't grow or didn't kick in mm -hmm. about self uh self self self-centeredness and yeah. self-constraint was just not working so strong strong for them and it helped them be they, they weren't the easiest people to be around at times yeah but they were but gloriously creative you know, it's a, yeah, I think it's a great speculation. I think it's one wants to be very, very, uh, very careful about speculating about diagnosing the yeah, brains of Bob Dylan sure. or, yeah. or Steve Jobs, of course. But I mean, that's only one thing that struck me while reading Steve Jobs' biography as well. Um, just, just, you know, you know, as, as Jobs once put it, the best way to react to new ideas is with brutal honesty. Yep. Um, and, and that book definitely, I think, brought out his brutal side. Um, but people you know. people say to me, you know, oh, he's a terrible person. The irony, though, is is like Dylan and many many others that I've that you've come across in your life. Yeah, people want to be around him. Yeah, so even though they're quote mean people, no, no, they and, draw and, people like a magnet and and inspire tremendous loyalty. Um, and, both and, both Dylan and Jobs. Um, you know, Dylan's had the same manager for years and years. You know, he treated Joan Baez. Terribly, terribly in the early 1960s, horrible. just horribly, and 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 yet she, you know, there she toured with him in 1975 for yep. a year. Um, so so you know, you, and Jobs you, dated you, her. It all comes full yeah, circle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it all it all comes back. Um, no, no, it's it, it's a fascinating question. I mean, what what really interests me about that is, especially in terms of Steve Jobs, because I think you know we've got this you know this this epic biography of him at this point. Um, is the way it complicates the traditional notions of self-control. I think we often think of self-control as domain general. If you've got lots of self-control, you can exert self-control in every facet yeah, of your life. Yeah, good point. And, and that's, that, at least for jobs, wasn't the case. Um, here's this guy who, when it came to interpersonal interactions, 
didn't give it, you know, didn't give a crap and exerted no self-control. So the first thing that came to his mind, and often that was, I think, really quite useful. Um, you know, you know, I think people often tell stories, you know, in that book, and I heard some, some of these same stories at Pixar of times when Jobs was really cruel and, and just cut to the bone, and yet they knew he was right. And, and, and so that saved them lots of time in the end yeah. because they didn't have to go through the usual kind of polite process of, of pointing out errors and then slowly realizing it was all wrong. He told them straight up it was all wrong. So, so in, in that sense, he had no self-control, and, and yet that book is also filled with stories of tremendous self-control, almost like aesthetic self-control, yeah. um, where like he just ate apples for a long time. Good point. Um, yeah, it's true. So, so, so he, he was a very, very peculiar man. And, and, you know, not surprisingly, human nature is quite complicated. Um, but, but certainly I think when it came, when it comes to interpersonal interactions, these are guys who, Dylan and Jobs, who at, you know, at time and time again were willing to make that trade off, willing to trade, you know, someone thinking they were nice or, 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 or trade that feeling of warmth and affection for, you know, for the sake of their art. Um, for the sake of their gadgets. Um, that, but at that, one point, that, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 please. So at one point, a very moving part in that book, uh, Dylan's uh, job says, I can't quote it literally because this is a G-rated program, but he says, you have no idea what it's like to be me when he's, yeah. when someone reprimands him for, rebukes him for being insensitive. And I just, it just struck me that there's a childlike aspect to both of these people in terms of the way a child will blurt out honest things about somebody's, you know, appearance or habits uh without the censoring and i just i don't know just an interesting speculation it's it's cheap talk. yeah no no certainly there's some there's there's something there um you know i just don't think we've you know i don't think it's i don't think we're able to say what it is yet i do think there is something childlike about it um you know I, you know i think because you know, certainly the, the dorsal upper frontal cortex is part of the brain we've been talking about that that you know allows us to inhibit our first actions first thoughts um, that's actually the last part of the brain to develop in little kids, which is yeah. one theory why little kids are so naturally creative because they don't have that voice yet telling them not to do something, not to put the brush there, not to make the mark there, not to put yeah. down their short story. And you talk so, in the book about how we have to, and I think everybody talks. It's not your idea. It's the you know tapping into your child childlike side, yeah. and uninhibited side. Yes, yes, and I think Dylan and Jobs were both able to do that throughout their entire lives, which is one yeah. way way they've you know. They, they, they became such creative people. But, but I do think there is something interesting for me, which strikes me about both of them is, 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 is their single mindedness, uh, more than anything else is just the one, the fact that they were willing to trade everything for the sake of, of this abstraction they believed in. Yep. As a song or, you know, or a new gadget. Um, that, that, that they didn't care about anything else and they certainly didn't care what other people thought of them. Yeah. They just wanted it to be the best thing possible. So one more Apple point, and then we'll we'll leave it alone. But this was just I, an incredible uh, light bulb moment for me reading your book, having just read the Jobs book. So the Jobs book talks about how he simplified their product line. They they went from a zillion products to four, and a lot of times Jobs would criticize other companies. He'd say they're making too many things. They just need to do a few things well, right? Yeah. So then I read your book, and you talk about 3M. And they yeah. only they they simplify. They only have fifty five thousand products, yeah. if I remember correctly. And yes, they're all no. and they're all great, <laughs> or a lot of them are yes. great. So talk about it. Just reminded me that you know, maybe Steve Jobs was a little bit lucky. You know, yeah. for him it worked for products, but for other people maybe it's not good advice. And how you can fool yourself um, into thinking you've you've mastered strategy for in the corporate world. So talk about why three M is so successful at generating yeah. ideas and a little bit about the facts because it's yeah. they're great stories. No, no, you know, 3M is probably the least sexy company in the world. Um, yeah, they you know, tape. They, they make they make tape and post-it notes. Yeah. Um, they make office supply products. Um, they make the stuff that people don't even want to steal, um, as one 3M put it to me. Um, and, and, and yet they've got this incredible track record of innovation. They've been in the innovation business for 65 plus years. More than a third of their revenues come from products that have been invented within the last five years. There's tremendous it's turnover at 3M. They've gotten almost one to one employee product ratio, which is perhaps their most impressive <laughs> statistic. And, 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 and what's most about 3M is just the number of different fields they're working in. So it's not just, you know, office supply products. It's nanotechnology. It's Pico projectors. It's, the healthcare business, not surprisingly, is huge for them at the moment. 
Um, so, so their model of innovation, to make a long story short, is really leverage, you know, to leverage this diversity whenever possible, um, to, to get people to apply solutions that worked in one domain to completely different domains. So one of my favorite stories I heard there was about how they came up with a, a new tool that would help them basically solve the battery life problem in laptops and reduce energy usage for LCD TVs, that they had this team of people working on batteries, trying to make batteries last longer in laptops. And, and they weren't getting very far. They kept on running into the same problems, you know, with lithium and so on. Then one day, then one day they bring in this guy who'd been working on scotch tape. He'd been in the scotch tape business. And so they sign him to this team. Um, he knows nothing about batteries, but he remembers that scotch tape acts like a prism, that it can help refract light outwards. And so he starts thinking about most of the battery in laptops goes towards powering the screen. And you can make the light bulbs dimmer so that, you know, you can save some energy, but then the screen's dimmer. It's less, it's less, it's less aesthetically pleasing. And so he realized that maybe if you could put, coat the screen with something that would direct more of the brightness straight outwards, that you could put in dimmer bulbs to get the same perception of brightness from the user. And so sure enough, they Genius. played with the actual glue and scotch tape and they ended up playing with the chemical formula, you know, quite a bit. But, but in the end, it grew out of this guy from scotch tape realizing that you could save reduce energy usage by 40% in laptops and LCD televisions if you simply coated the screen with this transparent coating that refracted the light outwards. Um, so so that, that, to me, in a nutshell, is the 3M model of innovation, um, where you take some guy working in tape and you put him in a completely new field and you see which answers that worked in tape can work here as well. Um, and this begins to explain one of the, I think, most controversial methods of innovation, at 3M is what they call forced rotations, where they try to have engineers move from field to field every five to six years. Um, so if you've been on tape, they may move crazy. into batteries. It's it's crazy. And 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 to be honest, I talked to a bunch of scientists at 3M who were not pleased with it, who who said this is so frustrating because just, just from getting to know a problem, they move you to something completely different. Um, and 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 yet I think at 3M they do this because they believe it gets them returns. Um, that that they. They want ideas always circulating inside the company. Um, and they, they, you know, they want people always moving about, always taking things that work in one field, trying them someplace else. Well, let's talk about the outsider because that's another theme that this taps into. You have an incredible – I love the story about <clears throat> Don Lee who's uh, – <laughs> ends up – what's his original line of work? Is it, what's his he, computer he, he, person he, for an insurance yeah, company? Yeah, he was a computer programmer for an insurance company. And t- um, tell us but, what – talk about what happens to him. Um, uh, well, what happens to him is his girlfriend breaks up with him. Um, and, and then he's heartbroken and lovesick. Uh, and so he starts frequenting this bar near where he lives, which happens to be, he doesn't know at the time, but quite a swank bar, very she, she, you know, they're not bartenders, they're mixologists. Uh, and he s- sits at the bar and he just strikes up a conversation with these guys and he, and he gets enthralled with what they do with watching them measure out their drinks. And he starts becoming quite interested in, in all these alcohols in front of him. And he doesn't go there to get drunk. He basically nurses one drink for three hours at a time. Um, but, but he just becomes very, very interested in these rituals. Uh, and so then, to make a long story short, he ends up becoming a part-time bartender for a few years at more of these very, you know, shishi bars in New York City. Um, ends up becoming obsessed with making the perfect martini. Like, that becomes his goal in life. He's, he's still working at the insurance company to pay his bills, but at nights he's working three, four, five nights a week till 3 a.m. at these bars because he just loves it so much. Um, so, so he really tries to make this perfect martini. And then one day, after he's pretty convinced that he's made the best martini that's ever been made in the history of the world, um, he, he realizes, whoa, 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 I can actually make new drinks too. I can invent my own cocktails. And so then he goes in this binge of creativity where he tries to apply his engineering background. Uh, he was an engineering major at Columbia University uh, with a special specialization in chemistry um, uh, to, you know, to, to, to all these cocktails. So he comes up with all these very, very clever drinks, many of which don't work. Uh, he tries to carbonate maraschino cherries. He wants to invent this capsule that will spin around in your drink so it always keeps it perfectly mixed. Um, most of these things really don't turn out that well. But then one day he starts to think about a process called fat washing, um, which is basically where you can take a fat and, and Don first used bacon. So you sweat off lots of bacon. So you got this pool of lard. Um, and, and then you can pour an alcohol all around it. And Don used bourbon. And thanks to, you know, the polarity of atoms, 
um, you know, alcohol and, and that they're, one's nonpolar and one is polar. And so they won't mix, but the flavors will actually mix and mingle. And so what Don did was he put the bourbon in with the bacon, let it marinate for a couple of days inside a walk-in fridge. And then he waited for all the fat to rise to the top, skimmed off all the fat, then skimmed it off again. So now you're back to a fat-free bourbon. Um, but now this bourbon tastes and smells just like bacon. Uh, it, 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 it's really quite bizarre. You just, you smell this bourbon, you start to drool. Um, but it's a little too much straight. Then he starts to turn into an old fashioned, adds in a dash of bitters, but he needed some sweetness to go with yeah, it. This, and, this is my favorite part. This is the, yeah. This. And, and then he remembers one of his favorite breakfast things where you're eating some pancakes and you got your bacon on the side and, and, and you pour some, you know, maple syrup on the pancakes, but then, you know, inevitably some maple syrup gets on the bacon too. And you think, and, and Don thinks to himself, and this is a G-rated show, so I'll have to truncate his quote, God, that's so tasty. That is the most delicious part of the breakfast. And so then he decides for, instead of just adding some simple syrup, to add in a dash of maple syrup. And that becomes the bacon bourbon old fashioned, which, you know, in 2010 was, you know, the drink of the year was, was, <laughs> was the hottest drink. And now you can see, you know, Bacon bourbon, it, it's become a bit of a cliche, and I think Don is a little embarrassed that he helps pioneer it. Um, but he's since taken fad washing in many different directions. He's now a head mixologist at the Mamafuko chain in New York City. Um, one of my favorite drinks of his, he calls the movie theater, which is where you fat wash melted butter and white rum. So you kind of brown some butter, so it's, you know, delicious and nutty smelling. Then you combine that with white rum, you strain out the fat, and then you mix that with some Coca-Cola. So it smells like the best smell in a movie theater. You know, you got the popcorn. Oh, oh. Yeah, you forgot the popcorn. Could have mentioned, yeah. He also steeps it with popcorn. Um, so, so it smells like kind of popcorn and butter and then Coca-Cola. It is quite delicious. It sounds horrifying, but it sells. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most of his drinks, you know, as he puts it, like, like they all sound horrifying. Um, and then part of the pleasure is that there is pleasure. Um, I think part of the pleasure is, is a surprise that it's not disgusting. So on a slight, not that, not that I want to denigrate the role of mixed drinks in our lives. Um, I'm always, <laughs> there's a part of me that always wants to stand up for um, uh, a little bit of pleasure. But yeah. there's a more important example of how, so he's an outsider. He's somebody who, yeah. who, who just, don't know anything about drinking, but he knows a lot about chemicals, and suddenly he can do things that the chemical, the mixologist couldn't do. But your more yeah. important example is Eli Lilly. So talk about what yeah. they do. That's an unbelievable story. Yeah. With the website. So, uh, just the lesson of Don Lee really is, you know, as he describes it to me, uh, if he told me, like, he, he knew so much less about alcohol than all these other mixologists. Um, you know, they knew more about all these alcohols. They'd forgotten more about, the alcohol, about all these alcohols than he could ever hope to know. But that did, that then the sense was liberating and allowed him to play with booze in a whole different way. Um, uh, in terms of Eli Lilly, this is a story told to me by Alpheus Bingham, who's now, um, the head of a company called Innocentive.com. And the story begins in the late 1990s when Eli Lilly is flush with Prozac profit. They've really trying to pioneer all sorts of different drugs, trying to leverage this one huge success, um, in the end to lots of different breakthroughs. He's the head of R&D for Lilly, and uh, he gets really frustrated. He says, you know, we kept on running into these impossible problems. We'd pour tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars into a particular, you know, drug pipeline. Then inevitably, his scientists would come back to him one year later, five years later, a decade later, and say, uh-oh, we hit the wall. We have no idea what to do next. For some reason, we, you know, we're making no progress now. Um and so here's the story again and again, and he just gets really, really frustrated. And so his, his bright idea is to say, okay, you tell me these problems are impossible. We may as well make them public. What do we have to lose, right? These are problems that no one else probably has solved yet. So we may as well just make them public. And if someone else can solve them, sure, great. You know, we'll post a reward. We'll give you, we'll give you a reward for it. Um, but now we've got a solution. We can proceed. So he decides against basically the, the wishes of everyone else in Lilly to make these problems public. And a few months go by, they get no answers. Bingham assumes that everyone else was right, that this was actually a terrible idea. But then the answers start to trickle in, uh, and they get one useful answer after another. They're actually making some fairly significant payouts now to strangers all across the world 
for solving Lilly's public failures. Um, and that's when he gets the idea that this is actually a very important R&D tool uh, that, that for the first time, thanks to the web, you can engage in real intellectual crowdsourcing. Um, and so he starts this company called Innocenta.com, which is now used by a bunch of Fortune 100 firms, Procter & Gamble, Lilly, Pfizer, Kraft, General Electric, companies with huge R&D budgets, you know, R&D budgets in the billions of dollars, and they post their hardest scientific problems online. Um, and, and what's quite astonishing about Innocentive is their success rate. Anywhere between 40 to 60% of the problems are solved within six months. Um, and they're solved by, you know, these strangers working in their spare time. Um, and, and what's most interesting about Innocentive, though, and this returns us to yeah, outsider thinking, right. <laughs> um, is, is, is that the problems, when you look at who they're solved by, they're almost never solved by someone inside that same field. So if GE posts a chemistry problem, it's almost never solved by another chemist. Instead, it's solved by someone on the fringe of that field. So it's solved by a microbiologist or a biophysicist, someone who knows enough to understand the terms of the question, but doesn't know so much to run into the exact same stumbling blocks as that chemist back at GE. Um, so, so this is, this is, yeah, I think now being seen as a very clear example of outsider creativity. Um, that, that in a sense, expertise, you know, it's wonderful, right? It makes our lives so much easier, but it also comes with blind spots. It, it also traps us in a web of assumptions. And so that's why sometimes, you know, those prompts you think are impossible, you need to give them to someone else, someone who knows a little bit less. Yeah, I would, I would never encourage someone, yet. Yeah, I'm getting close, but I'd never encourage someone not to go to college per se. But I'm struck by how success, and of course, many people who don't go to college have tough lives. But it's striking how a lot of people who don't go to college also end up with very creative and different outlooks on life because their brain yeah. just developed in a different way. I mean, Kevin Kelly, who I've interviewed, is just a great example. He, he doesn't think like everybody else, um, yeah. and that's a blessing. Not not a blessing for everybody. So it's not a general you know rule, but um, not being. Not, I think of it as digging out the grooves. You know, if you keep digging the grooves over and over again a certain way, which is what certain types of education expertise tend to encourage, yeah. you lose the ability to get outside. You're down in the chasm. You know, absolutely. Well, you know, let's not forget one of the big lessons one learns in college is conformity. Yeah. I mean, that's 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 one of the big things Shh, schools don't tell schools teach you in general. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's it's where we express ourselves and we flower. Yeah. No, but it's a part. It's a big problem with adolescence generally, right? We have this. Yeah, romance. No, you know, Dean Simonton has has made this controversial point, and uh, and you know maybe his data has changed a little bit too. But he argues that the when you look at the peak level of schooling for creativity, he argues it's two years of undergraduate education. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe there's a reason that you know all, all these very very creative guys like Steve Jobs Sergey they Brin. drop out. Oh no, Sergey um, Brin dropped out of grad school. Uh, actually, yeah, not, not college, but yeah. Bill Gates, yeah. Zuckerberg. You know, you think about the guys who've created a lot of wealth in the 21st century. Yeah. Um, these are guys who don't have college diplomas. Um, so may, maybe that's just straight straight up anecdote. You know, you know it's an N of three or yeah, an N of five. Well, I think um, you got to remember the denominator. That's the problem. So yes. it's it's not the N of five. It's the N of five divided by the two million people who drop out after two years. <laughs> most of them don't make it. But but still, yeah. but still, yeah, no, it's no, interesting no, that any no. of them make it. Absolutely. But but you know, one other way to look at I think outsider thinking and 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 the paradoxical curse of expertise, or at least too much expertise, is with Simonton's work on the peak age of creativity. Um, which is you've seen all these different fields, they have different peak ages. So poets and physicists, they 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 peak first in their early thirties, biologists, late thirties, novelists, early forties, and so on. Um and and these peak ages, you know, these 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 curves, they actually look quite depressing because you see these early peaks before you get tenure and followed by a long, slow decline for the rest of your <laughs> life. And you know, I, I, I think the initial explanation for these peak curves was that there's something inevitable about it, that the imagination just fell apart a bit like long-term memory over time. Um, decay, now I think the decay. assumption is it's really yeah. a byproduct of enculturation. Yep. That, it's, that it's, really, it's, it's really about you develop a set of assumptions, you become invested in the status quo, um, you develop habits and routines, which, which, which of course are essential. They, they do make our lives so much more efficient. But, you know, that can often make it harder to think outside the box. Can, you know, can often make it harder to rebel against the status quo, to, to look at an old problem from a totally new perspective. So one other point I want to make on this topic uh, and ask you about, and then we'll move on to we'll shift gears. But the, the thing that struck me about this, uh, the Eli Lilly site and the incentive is that the rewards are, are not trivial. Um, I don't think you talk about it in the book, but I went and got on the website. So you know one of the one of the miracles of modern 
the modern world is that crowdsourcing for free works at all, right? Wikipedia. Yeah. Wikipedia yeah. is – I often say on this program that most economists would have cr- incorrectly said that Wikipedia has no chance of being even remotely successful, yeah. let alone being great. And it's pretty great. Yeah. And it's the, there's no monetary incentive. There's a little bit of glory. But uh, a lot of people are doing it just because it seems like fun. Uh, yeah. So, But these problems that you're talking about, which are quite difficult – this is uh, not intrinsic motivation. Yeah, but there's because <laughs> these are a lot of these people are coming from outside the United States. They're coming. They're yeah. from very poor countries. The the amounts are in the tens of thousands, correct? Yes, sometimes seven figures. Wow. Um. So 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 some of the hardest problems, you know, some company will post a million dollar award. And um, they've paid those the companies. Out. The companies are typically anonymous. Um. You know, you can you can try to figure it out. Like you know, I saw the other. <laughs> Yeah, you, know, you know, I saw that there was there, there was one not so long ago for a low calorie chocolate compound coating, and I was like, I wonder if that's Kraft Foods because I know Kraft does a lot of work for them. Yeah. Um, but but you know, th- these are not trivial amounts of money at at all. Um, and and that's that's the incentive part of Innocentive. What um, was what was the problem where they they got four solutions? They were all different. And they paid uh, they all paid out. What was early on? Do you remember that? Yeah, that was one of their first kind of big case studies. It was just an organic chemistry problem. Um, that 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 a uh, that a farming company had struggled for years with, and the answers came, I believe, within a few weeks. Um, that they all of a sudden make the problem public, and then they get these four answers streaming in. And if you get multiple right answers, the companies are committed to they've got to pay out multiple. But they were know. multiple answers, different strategies, and the diversity yeah. of the people who came up with those answers. They were totally different professions, if I remember correctly. It's wild. Yeah. yeah that's, yeah, that's one of Alpheus's favorite stories. Um, but, but but that kind of shows, I think, one the advantage of crowdsourcing, but also the advantage of you know not just giving these hard technical problems to people with the most technical expertise. Because you know if you give that technical problem to people who all come from that you know that technical background, you may get solutions, but they're all probably going to be the same solution, right? Yeah. Because they've all been trained to think in the same way. So that's really the virtue of just opening up the floodgates and making these failures public. So in the, in the last part of your book, you talk about some of the ways that we might, as a society, enhance creativity. Um, and, and they aren't things like remove your prefrontal cortex, uh, by the way. <laughs> but uh, I, I want to, to jump off on that, I, I want to talk about uh, Bill James, who I'm a big fan of, econ undergrad, by the way. Uh, he had a great insight about – I think it's Wichita, Kansas, uh, and the, the way that – the United States produces sports genius. So, t- what was that? Yeah. Well, the 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 last part of the book, I, I focus on so-called ages of excess genius. These periods throughout history, like ancient Athens, Renaissance, Florence, Elizabeth in England, where you don't just get like one genius. You get this sudden cluster or clot of geniuses. So you get Shakespeare, you get Christopher Marlowe, you get John Donne, you get Ben Johnson, you get Francis Bacon. I mean, the John list Milton. goes on and on. Basically, all these geniuses living in the same zip code at the same time. It is it is quite eerie and and befuddling, and and Bill James could just, makes be, this could re- just be random, you know. By the way, it it, it could FYI. totally just be random. <laughs> it, it 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 could totally be random. That's a perfectly valid explanation. Yeah, but, um, but that's but much I do fun. Think there are some interesting patterns that recur through all these ages of excess genius. Um, T. S. Eliot had this great line when he was trying to explain Elizabeth in England. His his version of the story was that there wasn't somehow this sudden flourishing of talent or genius in the 1580s in London. They simply found a, they simply found ways to waste less genius, to waste less human capital. Uh, so that was his explanation. I think that when you look at all these ages of excess genius, that does seem to be one thing they all have in common, which is in general, they found ways to waste less human talent, um, often by improving the educational system. Um, let's not forget William Shakespeare was a son of a glover. His father sent his name with the mark. And Shakespeare was given lessons in Latin at the age of eight, free lessons, um, thanks to educational reform. Um, Christopher Marlowe got a full scholarship to Cambridge. So some of the best playwrights of this generation were fortunate enough that if they had been born a generation before, they would have been Glovers too. They, they, you know, they would never have gone to Cambridge. Um, so, so finding a way to let waste less human talent seems like a good idea anyways, yeah. but it does seem to be one of the patterns that maybe suggests this isn't just a random clotting throughout history. Um, but anyways, back to Bill James. Bill James makes this really wonderful point that when you look at 21st century America, we in a sense are living in an age of excess genius right now. It's just the geniuses we're so good at creating are athletes. It's physical genius. And he gives the example of Wichita, um, you know, not a big city, but it's produced Barry Sanders, Gail Sayers, you know, like one physical genius after another. 
Um, and, and, and you can see this at the macro level too. So America, we export basketball players all across the world. They have to have rules in Japanese baseball leagues about how many players you can, how many American players you can have on each team. We win the Olympics every four years. We are clearly very good at producing athletes. And Bill James says, well, why is that? And he, he points out that we've got this amazing pipeline for the development of athletic talent that, you know, we drive our kids to Little League and AYSO and Pop Warner. If they're good, they play against other good kids so they get even better. We lavish them with scholarships in high school and college. We've somehow trained professional sports teams to invest millions of dollars in draft picks, kids with unproven potential, many of whom often don't pan out. And yet that, that, that money trickles down. That becomes a big motivating force. So more people want to get good at basketball or baseball or football. And so he says it's this pipeline that has turned 21st century America into this athletic powerhouse. But then he points out that, you know, that pipeline doesn't exist for any other field, for any other type of genius. Um, that it doesn't Wichita, exist Kansas, in science. Wichita, Kansas doesn't have two Nobel Prize winners. They have two Hall of Fame football players that don't have two Nobel Prize winners in chemistry, as far as I know. We could be exactly. wrong. But, but no, 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 no. I mean, that's the point he makes. And it doesn't have two, you know, hasn't produced a number of great writers and so on. That, 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 that same pipeline doesn't exist for, you know, the arts. It doesn't exist for the sciences. Um, and so he argues if you really want to create an age of excess genius, you need to find a way to transplant that pipeline to other fields. And how, how might we do that? You have um, some interesting that, ideas. That's, some interesting that's a big ideas. question. Um, well, have- and, 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 you know, you know, you know, obviously there's a reason why sports teams are willing to spend millions of dollars on a 21-year-old um, college basketball player or, you know, or a 20 year old, you know, linebacker, um, simply because people will show up in droves to see those guys perform. Um, so, so there's a big business here, but here yeah, are some used- fundamental, some fundamental economics, which is, which is quite interesting that the, the pipeline part isn't created from the top down. It's created from the bottom up. No one, yes. they don't, you know, football doesn't even have minor leagues, right? It's, it, they, they've, they've used the college system. It doesn't work that, quite, that yeah. way in baseball, but all the stuff that we're talking about of the kids putting in those hours, it's unlike the Soviet Union or Cuba or other you know, communist authoritarian states. It just yeah. happens. It's wonderful. Yes. So, so, so obviously there are some, some aspects of this pipeline which are probably unique to professional sports simply because you know, those that's, rewards, what we, yeah. that's, 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 that's what we like to watch. It's a huge business. You know, one could make the case that this is this is a case for you know there should be some public investment. Maybe we should also find ways to pay our superstar scientists just well, might, of money. Joan, you might feel that way, but then when you read that point about the NIH versus the yes. the uh, yeah. H- Howard um, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, yeah, why don't you talk about that actually? Because that I um, I'm gonna I'm gonna quibble with your conclusion from that, but tell the story of, of what that study found. Sure. So, so this, this compared the NIH uh, and the largest funder of biomedical research in the world to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, which, um, you know, is, is known among scientists for, you know, first of all, it seeks out the best and the brightest, but, but, but it, it, it encouraged them to take risks. Its mandate from Howard Hughes is to fund avant-garde research, basically. And so while the NIH, you know, it's a very rational process, one of their goals is to not waste taxpayer money on research that won't pin out. So they ask for detailed explanations of how your experiments are going to work, what you expect to find, There's why you think hurdles. you'll find it. Yeah, a lot of hurdles. It's a very, very rational process. Um, and, and that's probably, you know, for all sorts of very good reasons. Uh, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, in, in contrast, they don't ask for an elaborate blueprint of your future research. They want an example of useful past research. Um, something that is something that you've done in the past that has panned out, um, and 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 this was the study done by a team of economists at MIT, um, which they tried to control for every possible variable, and certainly one can quibble with whether or not it's even possible to do in these kinds of you know analytical comparisons. Um, but but what they found is that the HHMI scientists that they produced more big breakthroughs, and you can look at this from a number of different perspectives. So papers with more citations, more home run papers, papers that introduced more new sci- words into the scientific lexicon. So they came up with new acronyms and so on, which is often a good measure of a really new idea when you invent a new acronym yeah, cool. um, and popularize it. Um, but, and this is the interesting part, these Howard Hughes fellows, they also produced a lot more papers with zero or one citations. So a lot more total failures. 
And their argument, and this is just compared to you know equivalent NIH scientists. So the NIH scientists produce fewer home run papers, but also fewer abject failures. And and the lesson the economists draw from this is that one can't get one without the other. Yeah, it's that, fatter, that, you get fatter tails. You get yeah. more, more greatness and more less great. That's a great. Often often from the same scientists too. Uh-huh. Um, but but that it's really about you know if you want those big home run papers. You need to encourage and incentivize the culture of risk taking. Yeah. Um, and, and you need to increase your tolerance for failure. Which is great. So, when, when I, my quibble with you is at one point, I think toward the end, you say, you know, we ought to encourage the government to take more risks. And it's just not their, not their DNA. That it's yeah. Just, and, and, and so, yes. I, my conclusion is less public investment because that, you know what you're going to get? You're going to get more pretty good stuff. But if you want great stuff, which is what changes the world and cures cancer, you. You need some of that other stuff too. And I have yeah, lots of friends at NIH. And, and, and I think it's people. been interesting to watch how the Gates Foundation has really stepped into the gap here. I mean, they're, they're, they're one organization which I think has very subconsciously modeled themselves after HHMI and, and really is trying to find ways to not just fund risky scientific possibilities, but also fund younger scientists. They've, they've really made a concerted effort to fund those scientists who are under the age of 30. Um, you know, one of the, most depressing stats I heard about the NIH is they actually fund more scientists who are exactly the age of seventy than all scientists under the age of thirty. Huh. Wow. Um, which well, which really goes. Expect. Yeah. Um, so so you know the Gates Foundation has really tried to I think try to correct for that, but you know the NIH has a lot. They've got very very deep pockets. Yep. So it it won't hurt them to at least create some specialized programs that I think are more self conscious. You know that 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 try to correct for some of these flaws in their process. Well, I encourage you to go visit them and make the case, um, but I'd rather you write another book, so I think you'll be more productive. Um, let's close. You have a lot of ideas uh, at the end of the book about other policy ideas, and but let's close talking about education. Um, obviously, our education system has lots of problems. Uh, almost by definition, it's a hard thing to to do, to educate people, but one of the things I think that is that is changing is the use of technology is really forcing, despite the incredible barriers to innovation in our current system at the K through 12 level, it's forcing them to, I think, eventually it will force them to be a little bit more uh, open-minded. And you remark on some, you talk about the school in New Orleans. I think there's a inevitable focus on time spent in the desk, uh, at the ch- yeah. in the chair, rather than outcomes, which are creativity, grit, all the things that really make people successful in life. And rather, there's more of a focus on how many hours you spend in the classroom. And I'm struck by how little uh, people learn in in classroom settings. And uh, what are your thoughts on how that might change and how would you like to see it change? Yeah, um, you know, obviously, that's a huge, hugely important question. Um, and, you know, one of the big themes, I think, in the, you know, psychological literature has been this emphasis on so-called non-cognitive traits. Um, so, you know, I think for much of the last hundred years, we've been obsessed with intelligence, with IQ scores, making our kids smarter. Yep. Um, it turns out that's actually quite hard to do, that our IQ scores, depending on which study you look at, but they're, but in general, they're pretty bounded by genetics, that, that we largely inherit our, you know, our IQ scores. So you can kind of budge them in the right direction, but that takes a lot, a lot of work. The good news, at, at least from the perspective of, you know, how to actually increase the chances for success, given how stable our IQ scores seem to be, um, is that the so-called non-cognitive traits, things like self-control, things like grit and conscientiousness, they turn, o- turn out often to explain a large percentage of the individual variation in success than intelligence. Mm-hmm. So I think one, one very clear lesson we should draw at least so far from the psychological literature is, is really invest in these so-called non-cognitive traits, try to teach our kids how to become grittier, how to increase their self-control, how to become more conscientious, that we should teach these lessons right alongside literacy and arithmetic and so on, especially at the earlier ages. Um, and, and that's the thing, one thing you see at NOCA, uh, this, this high school for the performing arts I profile in the book in New Orleans, um, they've, they've got incredible metrics, uh, and they focus on the metrics that I think are most meaningful. They look at college graduation, um, rates from, for instance, families who have never gone to college before, uh, and now they're off the charts. Um, one of the most impressive statistics is the school costs five million dollars a year to run, and the average, uh, amount of scholarships to the graduating class, if you average over the last decade, has been twelve million dollars. Um, so, so they're running a seven dollar net surplus most years. 
um, which, which, you know, it's a very, very impressive place. And they're, re- they're really not about sitting at the desk at all. They're all about, you know, as they put it, we're a vocational school and the vocation we're teaching is creativity. They want kids who are passionate about a given art form, whether it's, you know, making movies or ballet or writing poetry. Um, and, and then they just have them do it. Uh, they have them do it for hours every single day. Um, and, and really, you know, they, they talk quite explicitly about building up these traits like persistence, like grit, teaching people how to, you know, suffer through failures and how to get up, how to not quit, how to work hard. Um, and, and, and the way you work hard, you know, especially at these early ages is by just finding something you love. Um, Angela Duckworth, uh, who's, who's really one of the psychologists who has pioneered the study of grit. When you ask her, how can we build up grit in our kids? She's got this wonderful maxim, which is choose easy, work hard, that when you're young, it's very important to be exposed to a, a menu of possibilities. You know, find something you fall in love with. Find something that feels easy. Maybe it's piano, maybe it's violin, maybe it's taekwondo, maybe it's soccer, maybe it's chemistry. Who knows what it is? But find that thing that when you do it, you forget you're even working. You know, you lose track of time. And then once you find that thing, you, you know, once you commit to it, you have to be reminded every single day to work hard. Um, so choose easy, work hard, I think, is a maxim we should definitely take into our schools. Um, and, and instead of, you know, what we've, what we've done at the moment, I think this is largely for well-intentioned reasons that have to do with accountability, but we've almost gone in the opposite direction. We've become obsessed with these tests um, and, and we teach the tests that we've made it harder than ever for kids to choose easy. Um, and, and I think that's, that's, that's a shame. We're out of time, but I want to ask you one last question. We'll close with this. Uh, I found reading the book, um, and by the way, I'll add just for the listeners, it's, I, I didn't agree with every psychology study that you have in there. Uh, that's a topic for another time, <laughs> but, but the book is beautifully written. Uh, oh, thank there, there's you. a lot thank of, you. It's so kind of you. but there's a lot of lines that really sing and it's just, and, and it's a very provocative book. And I, and I, I found it a couple of times that I had some new ideas about problems I was working on because of things that, that uh, I read the book. I didn't take a lot of warm showers and work in a blue room, which are two <laughs> things that you refer to, but just things clicked in my brain from reading the book. And I'm curious, having immersed yourself in creativity for as long as it, I'm sure, took to write a book like this, how did you find it affecting your brain? Um. Was it different than writing a book on something else? You've written a bunch of books. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, you know, you know, I, I definitely tried hard to not get stuck in one of these recursive loops where I was too, too worried about my own creativity while writing about creativity. Um, but, but I did feel my own creative process, um, change just, just, just while writing the book. The, the two big ways are, I think, one, I've become much more willing when I'm stuck and stumped, when I don't know how to begin a sentence or finish a paragraph, now I'm much more willing to just go for a hike and leave my phone behind. Um, so, so in a sense, I've gotten better at wasting time. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to pretend like now I've got all my best ideas when I'm, you know, relaxed on a walk. Um, but it has been useful, if only because, you know, before I used to just stay up late and chug caffeine, and then you wake up the next day and you realize you're fixes haven't fixed anything and now you're just exhausted and you're no better off. Um, you know, the other, I think more interesting way that my creative process has changed. This is something I was not expecting at all is I've in a sense become much more willing to just talk to strangers. Um, now I'm one of those people on the plane who, when I sit down next to you, I, I want to strike up a conversation. And it's funny how people I think have this, this radar for people like me now they where yeah. they'll, they'll, they'll see me coming. And as soon as I sit down and kind of give them that knowing glance, like, oh, I can't wait to ask you a question. They put in their earbuds. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> they put their earbuds <laughs> Like I've become one of those horrible people who wants to talk on planes. Um, but, but this, you know, cause one of the themes, and I don't think I did a good enough job really making this clear in the book, but, but the most creative people are, are, they ask all sorts of silly, naive questions. Uh, they've got very diverse social networks. There's that one study by Martin Raff, the sociologist now at Princeton who tracked uh, 766 graduates of the Sanford B School. And to make a long story short, what he found is that those who had more diverse social networks were three times more innovative, and he measured innovation in terms of patents, trademarks, and revenue from those patents and trademarks than those with predictable social networks. Um, so these were computer scientists who spent time with biologists and ballerinas and so on. And, 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 and so I made a very concerted effort in my own life to just – 
you know, ask lots of questions, um, to, to just spend time with strangers, people who think differently, who speak different languages, use different acronyms, different assumptions for, for different politicians, um, ask, ask them questions because they'll tell me the most interesting stuff. My guest today has been Jonah Lehrer. Jonah, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.